I know listening to the three of you, I was uh, humbled by the depth of how you have um, thought through these connections between the vibrant, healthy lives we all want and um, trees and tree canopy. I'm wondering if you have had a chance to think about what, what's on the to-do list. How would you translate and take um, this research knowledge, these ways of thinking? I, I love uh, Jeff's idea of going in with a story and then testing that with uh, data and evidence. What, what should those of us, some of us are planners, we're architects, we're community activists, some of us work in public health, others think of ourselves as environmentalists. Do you have, do you have a sense of what we might do? How might we give voice to this? Where, where do you see the opportunities? I'm very interested in quantifying the relationship between tree canopy and a variety of different health outcomes. Um, I think that that lends a lot of credibility in the, in the planning conversations that are happening in local land use decision-making venues. Um, we've seen, uh, and, and Mary's very familiar with this because her journal has uh, really kind of fostered this sort of, re it's like public health and, and urban planning got divorced sometime in the, you know, about 100 years ago, and then they, they, they kind of discovered each other at a party again and, and rekindled the relationship. And, and, and now there's a lot of um, public health participation in land use uh, planning uh, activities at the local level. It varies across the country, but there are some pretty um, tight relationships. And one of the things that planners tell us all the time is that um, un before they had the ability to, to bring the credibility of public health voice into these conversations, they were viewed sometimes as, you know, I don't know, like they, they were sort of like these strange artists that were talking about, you know, smart growth or, you know, urban treescape or whatever. And then when public health came to the table and, and sort of linked those uh, strategies and designs to human health outcomes, um, it really bolstered um, their credibility um, in pursuing these kinds of uh, more progressive designs. And I think that... Um, trees, I mean, we've all felt it sort of like intuitively, but to have the actual quantified evidence and to bring that into these conversations, I think, uh, would, would really drive some, some real change in land use decision making processes. I love when people read the journal. So, you know, how lovely you are. And actually, you've supported the journal and you've done some work in the journal. Um, one of the things that my colleagues who are environmental health sciences always say is, why don't people care more about the environment? Why do you always have to find some kind of a, a human health effect? And I just say, because that's what people care about. You know, they care whether or not you, their community members are getting ill. They, they care about um, all of those sorts of things. But I love what Keith Tyndall is talking about, this ecosystem identity. You know, that we're all in this together. It's not the, you know, climate change out there and how can we build the biggest wall to protect us from the effects. It's that we're, we're, we're part of this. We're all in this together. So part of the direction that we're going in is we're using more of these system science, system thinking approaches so that for those things that we can now quantify, we can put them in our models. But for those things that we think are important, but that are harder to put a number on, we can still include them in, in our causal maps and our ways of thinking about it, and we can ask what if questions. So what if you're in a community and you can think of a, a broad range, and I don't know if you've seen some of these ways of representing the data. You used to think, oh, you have to keep it all in your head. You don't anymore. Some of the lovely work uh, that was presented just here where you, you can kind of visualize with using big data but easy ways to visualize things. So I think science has so much to bring to the table right now, you know, in making it easier for people to grasp these concepts that we used to say, oh, this is very difficult to understand, this is all complex, but just, just trust me on this. Actually, we can take things that are very complex and we can visualize them in a way that people actually understand and care about. So I think that's the challenge of science now 
to make sure that we use the best approaches, that we don't just measure what we can measure, we measure what we think is important, and that we ensure that the communities that are, you know, the ones that can take the information and run with it um, are able to really understand our findings and, and use it to advocate for better, better policies. I mean, I work for an applied research organization, so what I always uh, say to myself before I'm starting a study is, uh, or when I get the results, can somebody use this to make a better decision? If they can't, I need to find other work. And uh, so that, that's always a challenge. And I think, uh, I think storytelling, now, it, it's all, of, science is about stories uh, and telling compelling stories. And with trees, it's very easy to do. So you have these numbers. The numbers only inform the stories. I, sometimes, you're familiar with the Irish poet Seamus Heaney, who died last year. And he wrote a poem about the death of his mother. And he used the loss of a chestnut tree when he was a kid as this. As this. And I've, I've read this poem in presentations and then asked people to think of that experience they, they have as a child or as an adult, even losing a tree. And everybody can do it. You know, and so you, I, I think being able to translate numbers and things, but these personal stories, that will, that's what ultimately will get people uh, to make better decisions. A great homework assignment for each of us to think of writing down in just a little paragraph our, a personal story that we can then have it at top of mind when we're talking with community members, with policymakers. Let, let's get some questions from those of you. Uh, we have someone who will come with a mic, if you will. Wave your hands vociferously. Rick Parrott, thanks to Cindy and Ray and all the great folks there. Um, there is a, a, an evil spider on the Valentine's Day card, and that's called economic development. And I moved here from Southern California, where a lot of the arguments for trees, for park space, get completely, literally ground and paved under by the desire to build another CVS pharmacy, another subdivision. And they would argue, well, look, we just need the prosperity. We, we can't afford some of these things. We can't block out large land tracts, you know, and not have prosperity coming out of them because Southern California developed very differently than, you know, obviously things did up here. So what compelling arguments can some of these folks do against that pure, like, we love your ideas. Who doesn't want a beautiful green tree? It, like, literally, we can't afford it. We have to build because that's what our community is all about. And again, Southern California, Northern California, people think very differently, I assure you. Isn't it all just about income or prosperity. Uh, Tony showed us some relational diagrams. Uh, why worry about the trees and the environment? Isn't it about having everybody make a little more money? I'm, I'm all for self-interest. I'm an economist, you know, so uh, I, I, I quantitative study of selfishness and, and uh, arguments that appeal to self-interest are far more important than arguments that appeal to altruism. But luckily in this case you can make self-interested arguments. I've done some work and other people have on the effect of trees on the property values, for example. The type of cost benefits, it would make an insider trader blush. I mean, the, the, these are spectacularly self-interested things you can do. And so uh, I think I would make those. I wouldn't start waving your hands about and saying what you should do and for the better world, blah, blah, blah. These are, these are wonderfully self-interested decisions. The things that people with more resources want are the same things that people with fewer resources want. You know, they want safe schools. They want places for their children to play. I live in northern Manhattan, right next to a park. Some of you might have heard of the Cloisters, but it's that park. And that park was really down on its knees. That was not a, a park that a lot of people had an opportunity to enjoy. And it doesn't happen all at once. But we have this benefactor, Bette Midler. You might have heard of her, too. And she chose these parks in New York City that were down on, on their knees, and she gave them a little bit of a boost up. But that wasn't enough. You know, her initial investment took time, but pretty soon all of these groups came in. You know, people use the park for um, 15th birthday parties. It's a very Dominican community. We have uh, heat waves, and you can see Everybody is using the park during that time. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that there's a combination of things that happen. And I, I'm most used to thinking about urban areas. 
And it's when you have engaged civic organizations, you can have some private foundations helping out. The the New York Restoration Project is, is one that comes to mind. But also New York City parks and recreation. And what you can't do alone, you can do a better job of in collaboration. So I have no doubt that you will find other groups that will help champion your agenda to have healthier, you know, more vibrant um, neighborhoods in your city. And the, the challenge is not to just look for the usual suspects. Who would have thought Bette Midler, top of your list? So there are other people that are hoping for those kinds of things. And working with your elected officials is one of the best ways of, of really making making some of these things happen. Good morning. My name is Dana Karcher, and I work with the Davy Resource Group. Um, I live in Bakersfield, California, um, which is not the hot spot for urban forestry in the state of California. So m- my question really has to do with, you're all talking about cities. Well, there are cities in the Central Valley that exist south of Sacramento, very small cities, have abject poverty, horrible health issues, all the way through down to Bakersfield. So your comment about bringing in, you know, great philanthropists and things like that, where, does, where do these small communities fit into this? And how can we help them understand the connection between greening and, and health? I didn't get a chance in the 20-minute talk to talk about some of the work that we're doing. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those philanthropists and um, the California Endowment, and, and we have 14 communities around the state where we've made a 10-year-long investment in each of these places to try to improve the health status of the populations in these low-income communities that are experiencing pretty profound health disparities. Um, one of them is in Bakersfield. It's in South Kern, uh, in Arvin, and Lamont. And um, there we're actually trying to uh, Im- improve parks and open space and plant trees as part of our uh, environmental you know, enhancement efforts. When I say we, I mean the people that are working there are community residents, community-based organizations and uh, folks in some of the systems trying to enhance uh, that work. And we're we're hoping that uh, we're creating a model for other, particularly uh, rural communities, uh, to adopt. Um, You're right, there aren't a lot of philanthropists uh, in the Central Valley in a lot of these small places, and there are incredible power gaps between those that have and those that do not have. Uh, But I think that my co-panelists did suggest that this may be a wedge issue. Um, You know, this is not one of those, we we create these false dichotomies all the time, you know, either you have trees or you have parking lots. And, you know, the fact is that there's a lot you can do with infill development uh, to green a place up. Uh, There's a lot you can do with connectivity to hook up, um, you know, old uh, trails and train uh, paths to create these sort of corridors of sort of, um, you know, green corridors. Um, and it's, n- it's not that expensive. Uh, it does take time, and it does take some foresight, but it's not as expensive as we would think, and there are, it, there are resources in these um, counties and cities uh, for doing land use and development, and there are ways to sort of leverage other development that's happening to try to, um, you know, optimize the amount of, of that kind of work going on. So don't give up. It's not just an... Okay. I have been to Bakersfield in the summer. We had a board meeting there one time, and I almost died. So I know what you're talking about. I'm Bill, I'm Bill Sullivan from the University of Illinois. I just wanted to address your question as well and, I, uh, and uh, speak to the question of small communities. I think if we start treating water in a 21st century fashion, we, do, we, we meet the needs of um, greener, healthier communities. We meet the needs of poor people because uh, water is so central. And if we start treating, if we stop using the word storm water, and we start thinking about rainwater, and we design for rainwater, then we design for green infrastructure, then we deal with the kinds of issues that you're talking about. Maria Kelly, and I'm very honored to be here. It's a wonderful extraordinary educational program so far. Um, We know a little bit about trees and their magical qualities for dealing with air pollution, planting along the freeways, uh, especially uh, near residential communities. What do we know about the resilience of trees themselves to withstand the 
electromagnetic fields now that we're hearing about, learning about, especially from cell towers and satellites or whatever. Uh, how strong are our trees in being able to withstand this sort of pollution? But yeah, they're very stressful environments for trees. And when you're, um, particularly now when we think about climate change, we need to think very carefully about the trees that can withstand those harsh environments. So yeah, I think um, you know that people often talk about the right tree in the right place, and I think that we have to think about what the right tree in 10 or 20 years may be, and that may not be the right tree now. Um, and uh, so I guess that's my answer. After some of these devastating events, you, you know, people go around and, and the, the people go away, but you can see the trees. And it's um, very painful, as you mentioned, uh, with the blight. And sometimes the first responders go out and they just want to get rid of, of the damage. And, and some of the things they plant are not necessarily the right things to plant, and they, they, they don't last, but we're not so worried about that in the long run because we think the process of going out and caring for the community and trying, and so if this doesn't work, we try something else. We think it, of it more as a dynamic process and trial and error. And, you know, when the, when the people are, are coming together to plant, sometimes it's okay if it, if it doesn't take the first time. It'll take the second time. So I, I don't know as much about trees as probably everybody else in this room, but I care very much about our environments. And, you know, people talk about New York City. I'm so privileged. I have a little courtyard. I look out on my courtyard in New York City, and in front of my living room window, I have a tree. And it's just like everybody says, you know, when you have lots of trees, you know, maybe you take them for granted. But I have this one tree to mark the changing of the seasons and when I see the wind blowing it, my heart goes. So I, you know, I, I think what I'm trying to say is we're kind of all in this together, our trees and us. And um, I, I know that there are people out there who can help us a lot more with choosing the right trees, et cetera. But I think the idea about, about coming together and being one and part of that ecosystem is, is a very useful framework for getting people to care uh, about their communities and everything in it, and that they're a part of it. Do we have a sense of how much tree we need to get these sort of positive health outcomes, or is is this just too um, nitpicky of a kind of question? Is, is more always better? It's interesting. Um, when I uh, the the first Emerald Ashborough paper I published, there was a commentary on it by Howard Frumpkin from the University of Washington, and he talked about all this stuff. But he also, said, he also made the point that maybe traditional uh, uh, thresholds of proof are not appropriate uh, when we're talking about trees. There's not a great deal of side effects here. We know there's a lot of well-established co-benefits. It's not to say that these questions are important, but I've just finished a draft of this second paper, and what I finished with is say, okay, um, yeah, it's, it's okay to ask those questions, but we should also perhaps ask questions, at what point is it unethical to withhold treatment? And... Uh, I'm not, a, I'm not an advocate, but I would say that we certainly got to a point where that question can seriously be asked. I'm not a scientist. I, I was trained in science. I went to a lot of schools with a lot of people that claim to be scientists. Um, I'm a practitioner, and, you know, the, the, it, the, the work is in the doing. And I, I think that we can spend a lot of time asking questions, trying to perfect sort of our knowledge, but some of this is avoidance of, of actually acting. And uh, so I, I, I would agree. I mean, come on, trees. I mean, really, we're going to argue about this? Howie Frumpkin, he's not just at the University of Washington. He's the dean there at the School of Public Health. And I think he's about the kindest man in public health. He's really that lovely an individual and a great ambassador. But he's trained as an occupational physician. We call them Octocs. And um, he and uh, Dean Linda Freed wrote this beautiful paper about healthy aging and climate change. And I, I really loved it because 
a lot of times when you think of climate change, ah, oh, you think of aging, and, oh, and they wrote it in this way that they brought together two of the profound um, priorities that are going to affect us for generations to come. And instead of looking at aging as some kind of a menace, they looked at it as, oh my goodness, we have all this wisdom, all these people who really care, all these people who want to leave a legacy, who care about not just their children and their grandchildren, but all, all the people in their communities and, and climate change. We're all in this together. We, we don't know where it's going to strike. We know it's, it's filled with extremes. But in, instead of just pretending it's not there, we need to work together and get ready for it. And we, we need to, you know, make sure that we care about one another, check on one another. Maybe this is a way of bringing us all together. So thank you for bringing up Howie from. So I heard three takeaways from this panel. I'm sure you have more you could add, but let me share you, with you my three. One is go in with a story. So we all should think about what's the story that motivates us, that touches us, that makes that nexus and that connection between health and well-being and the tree canopy. Everybody needs to have one of those. Number two, um, we'll have to defer to the dismal scientist with us and acknowledge that there is some more power in self-interest often than in altruism, especially when it comes to policy debates. And so understanding the data, the science, the hard facts that are irrefutable about that connection of trees and health is really empowering, and it helps us give voice and vision to our altruism to be able to talk about the data. And the third is that we are only going to get this done through this sense of connection, community, and collaboration. That we need our personal story, we need the data, and then we need to come together with other like-minded people, those who are soon to be like-minded, and really work together to get this job done. Here in Sacramento, uh, we have the Five Million Tree Campaign underway. Um, we can do this. We can make this a beautiful, vital area for the next hundred years. Thank you for your attention this morning.